There's a chance you've seen those underwater hotels, where your hotel room is partially submerged, like with the Utter Inn in Sweden, or even fully submerged, as is the case with the Jewels Undersea Lodge in Florida, where you actually have to scuba dive 30 feet deep to access your hotel room. But what if you just stayed in a hotel room like that forever? Since the late 1950s, humans have attempted to live in underwater habitats numerous times with reasonable success. The first attempt at a form of underwater habitat was the aptly named Man in the Sea 1 project ran by Edwin A. Link on September 6, 1962. Robert Steinute spent 24 hours and 15 minutes at a depth of 200 feet in a portable air-supplied steel cylinder called the Spid. Link and Stanute made a second excursion in the Spid to a depth of 413 feet for 49 hours as a part of the Man in the Sea 2 program. Jacques Cousteau, one of the most influential figures of underwater exploration of all time, created a series of habitats in the Mediterranean Sea in the 1960s to truly figure out if humans could withstand living underwater, and if so, how long. In 1962, Continental Shelf Station 1 was set up off the coast of Marseille, France at 10 meters depth. Two men, Albert Falco and Claude Wesley, were the first oceanauts to live underwater for a week. Con Shelf 1 was a steel cylinder 15 feet long and 7.5 feet in diameter. Despite its small size, Con Shelf 1 provided numerous amenities, a library, a bed, and even a TV. Falco and Wesley each day worked underwater for five hours, studying marine life and building an underwater farm. Meanwhile, doctors monitored their health. Con Shelf 1 was a massive success for Cousteau, and a year later, in 1963, Con Shelf 2 was constructed at the bottom of the Red Sea. Soon after the second habitat was constructed, six aquanauts spent 30 days living in and around Con Shelf 2 at depths of 10 to 30 meters. Instead of just being one singular cylinder, Con Shelf 2 was comprised of multiple structures, a main starfish house that sat at 10 meters depth, a smaller deep cabin that sat at 30 meters depth, and even an underwater garage for a submarine, resembling a moon pool from Subnautica. This garage sat near the starfish house, also at 10 meters depth. Their pressure hulls are high-grade steel, almost a half inch thick. There are four wide-angle observation ports, three inches of solid plexiglass. They are submarines, but they are no ordinary submarines, nor is their mission ordinary. They are destined for the oceanographic research vessel, Calypso. The SP-350 Denise, commonly referred to as the diving saucer, was constructed in 1959 and became a permanent fixture of Cousteau's ship, the Calypso. The two people inside the Denise laid on mattresses, watching through small portholes in the front of the saucer. 
They piloted the craft using a simple jet propulsion system and operated the submersible's radio, cameras, sampling arm, and three movable lights. The SP-350 could stay down as far as 350 meters for as long as four hours without resupplying. During its usage for the Conshelf 2 program, it was repaired and resupplied at the underwater garage. The Denise was used for a variety of tasks during its time at Conshelf, studying sharks, reaching depths unsafe for a regular diver, and transporting goods. The SP-350 literally looked like an underwater flying saucer, and its time at Conshelf 2 gave the entire program a true space-age feel. With six aquanauts, food was consumed quickly, and each day, divers brought meals and supplies down to the habitat in a pressurized cooker. Aquanauts participating in the program performed a variety of tasks on the seafloor and received medical evaluations to determine the viability of living underwater. The aquanauts at Conshelf 2 studied sharks extensively during their stay in the Red Sea, going as deep as 50 meters in shark cages. While it's important to note that a portion of the funding for Conshelf 2 came from French petrochemical companies looking to exploit the seas for oil, Cousteau, after Conshelf 3, made a notable shift towards conservation of the ocean. During the Conshelf 2 experiment, Cousteau filmed and released a documentary film titled World Without Sun that exhibited all of what he and his team had achieved. When the Conshelf 2 experiment ended, the main house and the deep cabin were dismantled and removed, leaving just the underwater garage to sit and corrode. To this day, recreational divers explore the remnants of Cousteau's underwater village. In 1965, near Nice, France, 100 meters below the surface, Conshelf 3 was deployed. A singular building housed six aquanauts, who lived together for three weeks working a mock oil well. Funded entirely by the French petrochemical industry, Conshelf 3 was designed specifically to extract oil. Although Conshelf 3 looked vastly different from Conshelf 2, its design was intended to be much more efficient. The habitat was built so that it could easily detach from the ocean bed. The hole could be completely sealed, then floated to the surface. After Conshelf 3, Cousteau moved away from exploiting the sea and began to focus on protecting it. Due to the massive success of the Conshelf experiments and the large amount of media attention the Cousteau Society had gained from producing World Without Sun, caused numerous governments and scientific organizations to create their own similar habitats from the 1960s to the early 2000s. Some of the most notable habitats are the U.S. Navy's Sea Labs 1, 2, and 3, NASA's Tektite 1 and 2, and the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration's HydroLab. Cousteau had proven the concept with Conshell, and now the world was testing it themselves. Sea Lab, Tektite, and HydroLab all went without a hitch but other habitats ran into issues. Constructed in 1968, Biological Institute Helgoland, aka BAH-1, had a length of six meters and a diameter of two meters. It was designed for two people for use in colder waters. After completing its first mission, 30 feet deep at the bottom of the Baltic Sea, it was moved to the Germany side of Lake Constance. In June 1969, while lowering the habitat to a depth of 47 meters, the habitat flooded with two divers inside of it, and it sank to the bottom of the lake. It was decided by the research team to slowly raise the habitat according to the decompression profile, and the divers were safely rescued. BAH-1 laid the groundwork for the Institute's second underwater habitat, simply named Helgoland. The 14-meter long, 7-meter diameter laboratory was constructed in 1968. Marine biologists could stay inside the habitat in between dives for up to weeks at a time. Inside its many yellow tubes, the habitat contained a wet room for access to the habitat, a living compartment, a crew cabin, and even an escape pod. The underwater lab was used in the waters of the North and Baltic Seas, and in the 1970s, the habitat was decommissioned. Now all of the habitats I have mentioned previously have been decommissioned or dismantled by now there are still many habitats that are operating today. The Aquarius Reef Base, which sits at 18 meters depth in the Florida Keys, was constructed in 1986 and is still in use. Another operating habitat is the Log Chalupa Research Laboratory. Constructed in the 1970s, it was the largest and most technologically advanced underwater habitat of its time. Log Chalupa has now been converted into the previously mentioned Jules Undersea Lodge. 
Conchelf pioneered a new era of sea exploration, an era that is little talked about outside of scientific communities. That's why I made this video, to shed a little light on something I find very interesting. Thank you so much for watching. This is my first time making a piece of content like this, and I'll be making similar videos in the future. If you're interested in seeing any of that, feel free to like or subscribe. All of the music, videos, and photos used are linked in the description.